Good evening and welcome to Growing Up Strong. I'm Tony May. Tonight our show focuses on helping you prevent avoidable accidents in your own home, possibly preventing heartbreak as well. Did you know that the number one killer of children is preventable injuries. Joining me tonight are two experts. First, David Friedman, the Acting Administrator of the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Welcome. Thank you. Also joining us is Kate Carr, President and CEO of Safe Kids Worldwide. Thank you for joining us, Kate. Thank you. There's lots of topics we could cover tonight, so we decided to really hone into one that's been getting a lot of publicity and headlines, sadly, tragically, this past year, and that is heat stroke, specifically when children are left alone in cars. David, big picture, you, you have a lot of information on this in your organization. Talk a little bit about it. Well, the sad reality is when a child dies because they've been left alone in a car, it's, it's gut-wrenching, it's, it's heartbreaking, but it's also 100% preventable. If we follow a simple set of basic tips, we can ensure that no child would ever have to die because of heat stroke. No child should ever have to die for being left alone in a car. And one of the things we, we've seen, we've seen the stories over and over, um, that really strikes me is how does that happen? Kate, you've really focused in on this. You have a lot of numbers, a lot of research. What, what, why is it happening or is it just being publicized more now? Well, there's a lot of questions embedded in that, and we'll start with children. Children are not small adults. Their bodies heat up three to five times faster, and they simply can't cool down the way an adult can. When their internal temperature rises to 104 degrees, internal organs start to shut down, and at 107 degrees, that child is at risk of dying. This is a serious issue. Inside a car, the temperature inside a car, parked outside on a hot day or even a cool day, if the sun is shining, the inside of that car is going to heat up as much as 20 degrees in as little as 10 minutes. That's why it's important to never leave your child alone in a car, not even for a minute. And I think um, we were seeing some video while you were saying that. You guys did a great demonstration of how mm -hmm. quickly, especially here in South Florida, I mean, all over the nation, you made the point, but especially here, a car heats up. But what my question is, is it is preventable, but do you think people um, sometimes leave their child just for a few minutes thinking they'll run back in from the store? Is it that kind of situation or more just a total mind on something else, running a thousand places at once type of situation? Well, it's, it, it's really a mix of issues. Uh, about 20% of the children who have died because of heat stroke have died because their parents did just intentionally leave them in the vehicle. And that's why we're reminding everyone, there's never a reason to leave a child in a car, not for a minute, not for a second. That's a dangerous place to be if a child is unattended. But about half of the fatalities, sadly, come from parents who forgot their child in a car. And, and I know that can be hard to imagine, but I've got a five-year-old child. I know what it's like to be busy. I know what it's like to be exhausted. And especially when your routine changes, it can be all too easy to forget even something that's that precious as your child, which is why you've got to make sure that you put reminders in your backseat. You do whatever it takes to remember that your child is back there and that it's your job to get them safely to daycare or to wherever they're supposed to be. Kate, I know at Safe Kids Worldwide, you're dedicated to protecting children from preventable injuries. What are some of the things you're finding when you share with people their easy steps, they're really um, helping people avoid this specific um, type of accident? Well, when it comes to heat stroke, most people think that would never happen to me. I'd never leave my child alone in the car. But the reality is we've met many parents and they're, they're, they're doctors, they're scientists, they're lawyers, they're, they come from all walks of life. This can happen to anyone, anytime, anywhere. We've recorded heat stroke de deaths since 1998. Over 623 children wow. have lost their life in a hot vehicle. That has happened in 11 months of the year in almost every state in the United States. So no one is immune to this. And as David pointed out, when you have, when you're tired, when you're, particularly when your routine changes, and maybe you're stressed out, a new mom or dad returning to work after the birth of a child, or dealing with the day after a child's been sick, you can have a lot of things on your mind and go into autopilot and simply forget 
what you probably would consider your most important step of the day. And what about the new distractions, I would call them, my kids are grown now in college, but the new distractions, cell phones, you know, the, the, all the gizmos and gadgets on our car that can distract us. Are you finding that those also put you in that distraction mode? Well, anything that can distract you is a danger. But as Kate said, this has gone back to 1998 and, and well before them. Sadly, this is a problem that has stood the test of time, which is why it's so crucial to get the word out that you should never leave your child alone in a car. I really do think that the more people that understand how to prevent heat stroke, the better chance we have at truly eliminating this horrible problem that let's, we face. Let's, pardon me, let's talk about, okay, people outside of the problem. I see mm -hmm. a child in a car. We're in the era of we don't want to intrude on anyone's privacy. Yet you see a child in a car by themselves. Maybe they've been there five seconds, maybe five minutes. What is your advice with this, um, this campaign you're doing on, on what to do in that situation? Well, if you see a child alone in a car, and especially if they look to be in distress, they're crying, there's no adult around, the cars are locked, the car is locked, the windows are up, call 911 immediately. Emergency personnel want to respond to a false alarm much more than to a tragedy. And they're, they're trained to help you understand exactly what to do in that situation. So they will walk you through. So don't take the time to wander around and see if you can find an adult. Call 911 immediately. And I know you have some an acronym, right, that you kind of share, helping people remember what to do right. to avoid this problem. Well, Safe Kids, I think, has come up with a very effective tool. It, it's to act. And so, Kate, why don't you lead <laughs> folks through that? Uh, act is, A is for avoid, create reminders, or take action. Avoid by never leaving a child alone in a car, not even for a minute. And make sure you don't leave your keys or your car fob within easy reach of a young child. And teach that child that car is not a plaything. So don't let them get inside a car. Don't leave them in a car. Create reminders. Put something in the back seat, your purse, a briefcase, better yet your cell phone so you're not uh -huh. distracted, or your left shoe that you don't need when you drive. That's, that can help you create the reminder of something that you need at your final uh -huh. destination. And finally, the T for take action. And this is one for everybody. If you see a child alone in a car, take action. Call 911 immediately. Uh, David, do you have any hopes, any, any really goals with this, this partnership? And certainly you have a bunch mm -hmm. of partners. You two are here today. But there's a wide variety of partners both here in South Florida and all over the nation. Do you have goals of, of reducing these numbers? What is your ultimate mission in this? Well, the real mission here is to make it to change culture so that it's completely unacceptable for anyone to even consider leaving a child alone in a car and so that it's part of a parent or caregiver's daily routine to always ask, where's baby, and to always look before you lock. This is one of those cases where this really is about behavior, and we can change behavior if we raise awareness of the problem and give people the tools to do something about it. Okay, thank you both so much. Really appreciate it. It's so you. much information and thank such, you. such valuable information. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. We're going to take a short break and give you some of those tips and websites where you can find out more. And then next, if you think this can't happen to you, that would never happen in my family, think again. Our next father is just like any of us, and he has now made it his mission to educate people to never let this happen in their family. We'll be right back. Our first guest shared the numbers and some safety tips, but my next guest is truly an advocate from the heart. Meet Reginald McKinnon. Nice to meet you. Um, you live here in Florida, actually on the other coast, on Cape Coral. That's correct. And since uh, 2010, I believe, you really have become an advocate for this tragedy of leaving kids in cars because it happened to you. That's correct. So I, I know you've told your story and I honor and respect you so much. Um, what happened that day in March of 2010? Um, I actually, you know, was a day of going into work. Uh, my daughter had a follow-up appointment um, from some ear, uh, she had tubes put in her ears. Um, so I had left work and picked her up at daycare and proceeded out to the appointment. Um, everything went well. 
it was about a 20, 25 minute drive back to work. Um, you know, got her in the car seat and started going back to work. Uh, our daycare is just a, a block from where I was working at that time. And, um, you know, unintentionally I turned thinking my child was some in my head was telling me that my daughter was already at daycare and I, um, I went back to my job. Um, you know, lay, went to work, uh, finished the day. And, uh, when I left work and proceeded to, uh, go out to the parking lot, I went to place my laptop in the back seat of my SUV. And that's when I found Peyton still in her car seat. And what, what, I mean, were you shocked? Did, did it hit you? Oh my goodness. You had no idea. It never, uh -uh. never crossed your mind. No, it's, um, it's an indescribable feeling. So it's not something I would wish on anybody. Um, you know, it's, that will forever be the, you know, worst part of my life was finding her like that. And, and I know that the, the tips and the press conference we saw, they talk about this can happen to anyone. And, and I, and I really think that what you said was so important that prior to this, you thought the same as we all think, well, that'll never happen to me. Right. I had seen it a little bit. You know, I already had two children, um, but I had no idea of the numbers and the risk, um, you know, because it's only been tracked since really since 1998. And as a new parent, even, we're never told about, you know, it's something that you need to be thinking about all the time. Um, you know, and unfortunately, you know, that I can't go back on since losing her. And and you made the um, point in the story that I saw that it was not a typical day because normally your wife took the kids to daycare or would run her to the appointments, but she couldn't that day. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things the, the experts point to is that often happens when you're out of your routine and not making excuses, but just saying, that's why I think it really was an eye opener for me. When you get thrown out of that routine, things happen. Your mind's racing, you're late. You know, you, you think things happen that just didn't. Is that what they explained to you afterwards? Yeah, I mean, I really try getting answers as to why this happened. Uh, in many ways, therapist, my priest, you know, just friends, family, advice. Um, but really just this, the scientific piece of how the, the human brain works is really um, what it comes down to. And, you know, I just hope that people can, you know, hear our story about our loss and, and understand that, you know, we're just like anybody else, a family that, you know, we, two working parents with children that we love very much and um, but don't be fooled into thinking that it can't happen to you. And um, since then, I mean, again, I can't imagine talking about Peyton as much as you do because it does, you know, bring up that awful hurt, but it's also, it's helping others. So for you, it's cathartic and you said you really made this promise? Yes. Um, you know, when it first occurred, I, I couldn't tell you when I decided that, but, um, you know, I did make that promise to her that I would do everything in my power to reach out to other parents. Um, I know what it's done to my life and my family and friends and the community. Um, and each time I hear about uh, it occurring again, I just, you know, it hurts because I know what's going to happen, you know, going forward with those families, a lot of those turn out really bad. I was going to ask that because um, we have friends that have lost a child in a different circumstance, but it's a big strain on the family. Yes. Just is that's that's psychology. So has this effort to help others never go through this? Has that helped your family? I know your daughters have talked about it. You said before. Do you think that's helped kind of somewhat work through it? Um, you know, we've been very open with our children, even as young as they are. Uh, we still um, celebrate Peyton's life, even as small as it was. Uh, we spend time with her at her, her grave site. We celebrate, you know, um, her birthdays. And, and, you know, those days are tough, holidays, all that stuff. But at the same time, we try to make it um, a positive thing. Um, 
and we want our children to understand because they, even as young as they were, um, they ask a lot of questions, even at seven and eight years old. And you said the community, do you, do you find it tough sometimes? Do you find um, people may not understand, A, how it happened, but B, why you're doing this? Do you ever face kind of roadblocks when you want to talk about this? Um, not so many roadblocks. I mean, there's not a lot of platforms. My local community, I mean, obviously Safe Kids, and, and um, I've worked with NHTSA in the past too. Um, they've done a great job at allowing me to get my story out there. Um, but locally, there's a lot of um, local events that go on for different types of safety, whether it's a, a kid's fair or something like that. Um, they do give me uh, the opportunity to come out and Actually, my wife and my kids will be there, and we share our story. And do you think that, I mean, I just have to ask, we, we saw all the um, great information that NHTSA and Safe Kids and all those other people um, joining you at the earlier press conference were giving out. If you would have done that, I mean, would you, do you think it would have helped? Like, I love the idea of the cell phone and the, I, I, I gotta be honest, I would have never thought to do something like that. So in my life of having toddlers 17 months apart, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I would have even thought, but do you think if you would have that tip to put a cell phone back there, to put a shoe back there, I mean, do you think you would follow it or your wife would follow stuff like that? Is it realistic, I guess, is my question. Uh, it definitely is. Um, you know, creating those reminders is, is the key. Um, I still have two young children, so I'm not forbidden from this because it happened to me. Uh, so we do, my and you know, um, Better communication, you know, when we do have appointments and stuff, my wife, she'll tend to call to see how we are, um, you know, making sure you talk with your daycare uh, when you have an appointment. And definitely, you know, doing those things to create those reminders because, you know, the it, it only takes a second and it can be too late. Um, those things with, you know, cell phone. I, even before losing Peyton, I actually did put my laptop in the back seat it was just the fact that I was already at work. So it's even remembering, you know, at all times. Right, right. Not, not just right. Um, in that little area. Do you meet um, ever with parents who have lost a child, either in this circumstance or other circumstances? Because as you uh, mentioned to me off camera, this is not a club anyone wants to be in, but tragically you're in it. Do you find that that, that is some solace? Um, I have met other parents. Um, you know, there's that similarity. Uh, it's very tragic. You could see, um, you know, the pain that they're going through and everybody reacts different. Um, some are able, to, very few are able to talk about it. Others, um, you know, just rely on their faith and their family to get through it. And, um, but yeah, it's, uh, of the ones I've met, I, I'm actually friends with some you know, that live in other states just because uh, through my speaking or reaching out, um, we've talked over time and, um, you know, I feel like having that piece to, to know that someone else is out there that's gone through the same thing is, it helps a little. And do you feel that at all? Do you feel that you and your family are making a difference by being so brave? Because that's what this is, brave. Um, and speaking out, have, have you had any feedback from people that said, thank you so much, I never thought about that and I'm gonna be more careful or like me, wow, you're really being judgmental thinking this will never happen to you because this guy looks exactly like my family. Yeah, um, I've had lots of feedback, um, good and bad, but I think overall more um, you know, beneficial things. People have uh, opened up and admitted to doing things that they probably shouldn't have and Thankfully, nothing bad happened, um, but definitely, uh, you know, I have a big thing with new mothers, especially single mothers. Um, they seem to, uh, they, well, they're, they get emotional, mm -hmm. you know, because they think about the, and uh, their child and uh, that they realize it could happen to them. So I don't get a lot of, like, I don't know what the impact is. I just know in my heart that, you know, if I'm saving one child's life, then, you know, Peyton's life isn't in vain. Amen.
Well, again, thank you and your family. To We talked about this, to talk about it and be brave like this is more than I can imagine ever doing. Truly, Reggie, thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. We're going to be back uh, right after this. Stay with us. When Mommy was pregnant with my baby brother, she cried a lot. It's not that she didn't love us. I know she loves us. She just needed help. And she got it. That's why Children's Services Council invests in programs that help women when they're pregnant and after their baby is born, because children who are born healthy are more likely to do better in school and in life. So kids like me grow up healthy, safe, and strong. Joining me once again is Kate Carr to talk about some of the other preventable injuries that you can stop from happening. Thanks, Tony. So Safe Kids Worldwide, a nonprofit that literally focuses on preventable injuries? That's right, preventable injuries. As a mom of three, I never realized until I started working with Safe Kids that a preventable injury was the number one killer of kids here in the United States and a major cause of death around the world. That is, I mean, you were telling me some of the numbers before we went on, and I really can't fathom that that the accidents and preventable ones kill more than, say, a, a disease does. That's right. I mean, we think about childhood cancer. Right. Um, and I've, I've worked in global health, so I've worked in HIV AIDS, I've worked in malaria, I, did, I work some time in brain cancer, all big things that get a lot of attention. Yet when you add up car crashes, drownings, fire and burns, suffocation, poisoning, you start to get some very large numbers. And these are all things that we can predict and prevent. And I think, is it because we want to believe that can't happen to us or that happens to someone else on a lot of those? Is that why we don't hear as much? It might be that, um, I'll say in car crashes, we did a survey recently and we found parents telling us, well, I let my child be unbuckled when I'm close to home. Yet most accidents occur near a home. So you're not connecting the dots of what you think is safe to what is really not safe. And in many cases, it's small little things that we can do so that our kids can grow up to do great things. Let's start right there, accidents. I have to admit, I have seen pull up to a traffic light, looked over, a small child, not in any, not just a car seat, but even a seatbelt, he's leaning up talking to his mom. It goes through our mind like, what are you thinking? Exactly. What do parents say when you ask them, why don't you buckle your child? Well, what they said to us was, I, I was in a hurry. Um, I was close to home. Um, my child was fussing and I let them out. Or the one that surprised me the most was, I did it to reward my child. I let them not ride in a seat belt. Um, or in a car seat. And that one to me is like the craziest of all. That is crazy. It is crazy, yet so we have to get that message out about the importance of, of buckling up every ride every time. And I think the younger you start it, the better. It's a habit. It's a habit no matter how old we are, one that we, we just have to buckle up every ride. Um, here in Florida, drownings. You mentioned drownings. Yes. I know they may not be as big of a deal in, say, a uh, metropolis, but here in Florida, big deal. Talk about talk about how can we stop that from happening once and for all. You know, drownings are a big deal no matter where you go. It doesn't matter what the larger number is. The loss of one child is a tragedy for a family and a tragedy for a community. So there are three things that you think about uh, in drowning. For very young children, they can drown in an inch of water. Wow. So you don't want to leave a bathtub with water or a bucket or anything that a child can get into. As kids get a little older, toddlers tend to drown in pools. And so you want to be sure you take the precautions about gating your pool and observing children when they're in or around water. So important that there's always adult supervision of of children uh, when they're in the water. And I think anyone should always have someone, a buddy that they're swimming with. And finally, for our kids as they get older, it's open bodies of water. It's the ocean or a lake or a river where older kids will swim and sometimes unaccompanied and they run into situations that they just didn't expect. So we wanna emphasize the importance of one, learning how to swim, always having a buddy if you are swimming, never swimming alone, and two, for adults, keeping their eyes on kids, direct supervision while kids are in water. And for, for our audience, we have a lot of grandparents, a lot of aunts mm -hmm. and uncles here um, that may not have kids 
full time. So briefly, if you're watching your newborn grandbaby or two, three month old grandbaby, how should they be sleeping at night? Oh, sleeping is alone on the back and in a crib. And so that's very different than blankets and pillows. And, and those cute bumpers. And the bumpers <laughs> and the stuffed animals. All of that should come out. And babies should always be alone, on their back, and in a crib. Because the danger of suffocation for our children under the age of one is very high. There are a thousand infants under the age of one that die in the United States from suffocation. To me, every death is heartbreaking, and that one is even more heartbreaking because you, you want to think you could have prevented it. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Great it's advice. Great Thank to you. be here. Thank you. You can also find out a lot more information on the Children's Services Council website. They have a whole Safe Kids segment. Here's Children's Services Council CEO Tana Abley with more on how to use the website. Did you know accidental injuries are the number one killer of children? Children's Services Council of Palm Beach County and Safe Kids Palm Beach County want your children to stay safe just as you do. That's why, as part of our What If Child Safety campaign, we've developed the definitive website for child safety issues in Palm Beach County, whatifpbc.org. You can learn important safety tips to protect your children from dangers such as drowning and keep up with emerging risks to your child's safety. For example, did you know there has been an explosion in calls to the poison control centers involving children swallowing liquid nicotine used for e-cigarettes. Did you know that the number of children who have suffered injuries from swallowing button batteries has jumped more than ninefold in the last decade? Did you know that 78% of moms with children under two have admitted to using cell phones, even texting while driving? The What If website has four different categories, around the home, around water, around town, and around cars. Every three months, the What If campaign focuses on one of those categories. In addition, families in Palm Beach County can receive a free pool door alarm by filling out a brief survey that can be found on the Around Water section. The website also links to information on where you can get free car seat safety checks. The What If campaign is a child safety initiative by the Children's Services Council of Palm Beach County and Safe Kids Palm Beach County to provide parents and caregivers vital, life-saving information that protects children in the home and in the community. For information, visit whatifpdc.org.